everyone. Hi, Miriam. Thank you so much for joining us today and for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us um, for our fourth station of First Friday with Fairbanks series. The First Friday with Fairbanks series is made possible by, by the IU Alumni Association at Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health, Health Alumni Board. The Alumni Association will host um, a live Zoom event featuring a Fairbanks student and a faculty member from January to May. Each session will be recorded for individual interest in the topic, but are unable to join us. My name is Mariam Silla. I am from Guinea Conakry in West Africa. I'm a second semester MPH student with a concentration in social and behavioral science. Today, I'll be with Dr. Grant, who served as an assistant professor in the social and behavioral department. Dr. Grant will be speaking about how to find what works in addressing social and behavioral determinant of health. This discussion will focus on evidence clearinghouse, which are influential repository of information on the effectiveness of intervention and how these clearinghouse are increase, increasingly used to inform public health policy and practices. Throughout this event, please utilize the chat box below. Click the chat option. Clicking the chat option will open the chat box on either the right or the center of your screen. This is where you should type your questions for Dr. Grant or myself or initiate conversation with other participants. Once you're finished typing your question, hit enter and feel free to either exit the chat box or leave it open to keep an eye on a side discussion that might be happening. We are hoping for a robust conversation and we will be referring to question at the halfway point of the session and at the end of the conclusion. We will be monitoring question and we'll try to get them all. A few reminders about Zoom. We have automatically turned off your microphone and we'll attempt to keep everyone muted except for those speaking and asking questions. Additionally, this session is recorded for those who could not attend today. We appreciate your willingness to connect virtually. On that note, let's get started. Dr. Grant work aimed to advance the credibility of intervention research and its, and its utility for supporting evidence-based policy and practice. Conduct applied research across the behavioral social and health science with primary focus on social behavior, on behavioral health. He has served as a scientific advisor to the World Health Organization, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, CACRN US Satellite on Pregnancy and Childbirth Group, and the UK Medical Research Council Project Developing Guidance for Exploratory Studies and Process Evaluation of Complex Intervention. Dr. Grant is particularly active in connecting the movement toward open science with what work movement in social and health policy. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Grant. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Lovely to see you. One day, hopefully, we'll have a class in person, but I feel like we're close already from all of our virtual stuff. Um, so I'm going to pull up some slides. Maybe Crystal and Miriam let me know that this is working. Can you see the slides now? Okay, great. I'm doing the advanced share portion, so I've got my lecture notes. I won't be able to see people as I'm talking, so Miriam or Crystal, if someone's shouting out or needs to interrupt me, let me know. But I think what we've decided for a format today is kind of two quick presentations, about 10 minutes each, with some time for Q&A after. Um, the first part will be an overall conceptual overview of what clearinghouses are and the evidence-based practice movement. And then the second bit will be a bit more of a worked example of how to use a clearinghouse. So I'll give you a link if you want to follow along on your own computer you can see how to use this tool for your own work and then we can chat after the presentation. I love this stuff, it's my jam. So reach out at any point if you're keen to chat about it. Um, but before I get started, again, I'm Sean Grant. I am proudly in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Fairbanks School of Public Health. Uh, a lot of my research is on this what works movement in social and behavioral sciences. And I'd be remiss not to give some thanks to sponsors of some of the work that I will be discussing that I've conducted. So many thanks to Arnold Ventures, 
the Wallace Foundation and the William T. Grant Foundation. We've got a great ecosystem of foundations in the U.S. supporting rigorous work on public health, particularly social and behavioral determinants of health. So as I mentioned, this first bit will be more of an introduction to what clearinghouses are and how they fit in public health practice, particularly the evidence-based practice paradigm. So uh, I imagine some of you are familiar with a figure like this or perhaps this particular figure, but as a reminder, uh, in the mid 90s, Haynes and colleagues introduced this conceptual model about depicting how research could be integrated, particularly in the clinical practice of medicine. And this three circles model uh, has been adopted by the major health disciplines since, including public health. And it's been termed this evidence-based practice paradigm where you're using the best available research evidence, a client or a population's characteristics, needs, values, and preferences, and then the resources in a given environmental and organizational context, particularly the practitioner's expertise, to come to a decision. And it's called the evidence-based practice model or evidence-based practice paradigm because a core aspect of the model is to speed up the rate at which research discoveries, the best available research evidence is translated into practice. Because historically, this rate has been somewhat glacial. Some estimates are it takes 17 years or more for a research discovery to actually make its way into real world practice and policy. So for those of us in the social and behavioral sciences in public health, that particularly means accelerating the identification and the implementation of evidence-based interventions, evidence-based practices, programs, and policies that address the behavioral and the social determinants of health issues for individuals and populations. So what do we mean by behavioral determinants? Kind of a quick background to our area. One of the uh, leading frameworks in the behavioral sciences is called the COMB model, capability, opportunity, and motivation all drive behavior. You can think of it as finding the right combination to unlock a behavior. Or for those of you who watch uh, things like NCIS or Law and Order like myself, it's sort of the means motive and opportunity model. So if we want someone to change their behavior related to substance use, thinking about their knowledge, skills, and abilities to do so, uh, are they motivated to change the behavior and are there opportunities in one's physical and social environment to make the behavior possible? And that last category really speaks to what we mean by social determinants. So certain constructs of interest that might at the face seem like they're irrelevant to health, but actually explain the greatest variance of differences in health across populations in our state and the country really globally. And these are things like economic stability, educational opportunities, one social and community context, access to quality health and clinical care, one's neighborhood and physical environment, and issues like food insecurity, hunger, access to healthy food options. So it's programs that improve health and populations by making changes to one's capability, motivation, and opportunity, and particularly for that last category and opportunity, we're thinking of things like economic, education, social community context, et cetera. So in our space, a lot of practitioners identify as working in health promotion and disease prevention. That's kind of a big tagline for folks who have the social and behavioral science background. And public health practitioners in this area are increasingly tasked with using programs that have demonstrated strong impacts in high quality research studies. That's the evidence-based practice paradigm. So with this increasing focus on the use of evidence-based practices to improve service delivery, there has been increasing interest on what transforms a regular program into a quote, fancy evidence-based program. And then subsequently, how to identify those programs that meet these criteria for being evidence-based. Two major challenges to this, there are many, but two major challenges to implementing this model of evidence-based practice in reality is one, getting methodologists like myself, the nerds who think about research methods and standards of evidence, to actually agree on these criteria across sectors, across disciplines, even within sectors and disciplines, there's quite a lot of variability in what makes a program evidence-based. So if nothing else today, if you have to do something evidence-based for a funder, some kind of policy regulation, it's really important to look at the definition of what they mean by evidence-based to make sure you're in line or adherent with that policy. But then another major challenge beyond operationalizing what makes something evidence-based is the massive and growing amount of information about social and behavioral interventions, about what programs are evidence-based, and then how to synthesize this information in a way 
that is useful for practitioners, for policymakers, for administrators, for the public at large? So how do we scientists kind of distill this information so it's useful and actionable to you, the heroes on the front lines actually doing the work? So effective mechanisms for access to credible and timely information about evidence-based programs have been a really big priority for folks in this space. So to meet this challenge, there have been a number of What Works clearinghouses that have emerged to assist policymakers, practitioners, and other decision makers in selecting interventions with the greatest potential benefit to individuals and society in their local context. So these are some examples at the federal level. Prevention services is for the child welfare system. Home V is for home visiting for families with infants and young children. Clear at the Department of Labor is for labor interventions. Um, so various clearinghouses, this is just a sample, but there are, depending how you define a clearinghouse, literally over 100 of these out there globally, with dozens and dozens based in the U.S. alone. And what these clearinghouses do are conduct transparent and comprehensive searches to identify studies that evaluate interventions in their given topic area. So what interventions exist for uh, child welfare systems, for preventing child abuse, child maltreatment, retaining families intact. Once they find these studies, they rate those studies according to evidence standards. So they use explicit standards of evidence so that you, the user, are clear about what they mean when they call a program evidence-based or not. And then they also tell you for whom does it work, under what conditions, and what is the evidence of effectiveness? How well does it work on given outcomes in a particular space? How well does it prevent substance misuse, for example? They then share this information, they share these results on their websites, and the best ones typically have some kind of interactive searchable database, and that's the walkthrough we'll do in the second part to show you what that looks like. And these websites ideally are meant to help state and local administrators, policymakers, practitioners, the general public to make sense of the results in a given area and better understand how this evidence might apply to the particular context that matter to you, to your local context, to your priority population, to your community. And then many also, particularly for the research audience, synthesize the overall state of evidence in their research field through reports so that then that research area can get together and say, what is the priority for the next cycle of interventions we should develop and evaluate? And while these clearinghouses in some form have been around for a few decades, some of the earliest ones now, why they're increasingly important is a recent movement towards evidence-based financing mechanisms. So mechanisms, particularly from state and federal and sometimes local governments as well, to show or demonstrate that you're implementing an evidence-based program in order to receive public financing for delivering that service. So one model are tiered evidence grants. This allows, for example, federal agencies to award smaller amounts of grant funding to promising ideas with limited research evidence and larger amounts of money to interventions or practices with strong evidence of success that have been replicated in multiple settings. So they feel confident scaling those up more nationally. We've also in the last five years started to see tiered evidence federal legislation so this is when Congress actually authorizes funding in a given policy sector that includes requirements for programs to meet with regards to their research evidence. And then state level agencies need to demonstrate adherence to these requirements and the plans that they submit to the, federal, the, the relevant federal agency for funding. So one example, I talked about the Prevention Services Clearinghouse on the last page. There's the Family First Prevention Services Act, which deals with the child welfare system in the US that in the legislation said there needs to be a clearinghouse. The clearinghouse was actually created in response to that legislation. And then they offer federal reimbursements to states implementing specific prevention interventions that meet the evidence standards in that legislation, but they require that at least 50% of state expenditures are for well-supported practices. So those with the stronger research evidence behind them. And then one more movement that might be particularly of interest at the local level are things called social impact bonds or pay for success models. And the way these work are they're public private partnerships that fund effective social services through performance based contracts. So an impact investor provides the capital to scale the work of a high quality service provider that could be perhaps a foundation 
that is based on supporting community-based organizations in a given area on a given public health issue. And then the government, the state government, the federal government repays those investors if and when the project achieves outcomes that generate public value as determined by an independent evaluator, say researchers at a university who are at a, an objective third party and understand how to evaluate programs. So these are just a few examples of these kinds of mechanisms. Some uh, specific ones you might be familiar with in your work, the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program uses evidence standards, TAM for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. There are really loads of these, and they are somewhat in a one-to-one -one correspondence matched up with clearinghouses that tell you which programs meet those standards. So one review that I did, uh, funded by the Wallace Foundation, looked at which social and emotional learning interventions, those in, uh, delivered in K through 12 school settings, public school settings that work on students' social and emotional competencies, which ones meet the evidence standards in the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was the reauthorization of the education legislation in the US uh, about five years ago or so. And then along with this report, which provided I think we found about 60 interventions that met these evidence standards, and then we provided a summary of each of these interventions so that a decision maker could figure out which ones meet their local context. We also created a companion guide that provides guidance for decision makers at the state level, at the local level, to assess their local needs and to identify appropriate evidence-based interventions that are in this guide. And that's the general model that underpins each of these clearinghouses is a repository of evidence-based practices with information about those practices, and then guidance on how to use that clearinghouse combined with our program planning models in the social and behavioral sciences to find the intervention that best meets your local needs and has the strongest evidence behind it. Uh, a few things I wanna flag in terms of ongoing work that I have, if anyone's keen, you gotta do the shameless plug with these things. Um, clearinghouses over the years really do tend to update their standards and processes with advances in social and behavioral science. So as Miriam kindly mentioned, I'm very active in the growing movement to make our research more transparent, reproducible, and open, because uh, we believe that that leads to evaluations being more likely to provide true and accurate results, to increase trust in research because our books are open, align scientific practice with their ideals of being open and collaborative, and thereby it accelerates scientific discovery and broadens access to scientific knowledge. So one example of this is uh, my lab, which is called Trust, worked with the folks at the Home Visiting Clearinghouse in their update to their standards and procedures to include guidance for the research area on incorporating things like registering their studies, sharing their protocols and analysis plans, sharing their data and code so that Others can double check that it's reproducible into their standards to kind of nudge this field to say, hey, this is the next frontier of evidence standards, perhaps in five years time, we're gonna start requiring this stuff like it's required for FDA approval of drugs, devices, and biologics, but in a way that meets the unique challenges of social and behavioral interventions. So if anyone is uh, keen to explore that topic further, either today or offline in the future, uh, we have worked with clearinghouses and other policymakers, but we're also doing work related to researchers adopting transparent and reproducible workflows, journals promoting these standards for the articles that they publish because these clearinghouses really depend on the published scientific literature, and then getting sponsors, so those who fund evaluations, to encourage or require their grantees to incorporate these practices, but then provide them with the guidance and financial support to incorporate them in their workflows. So that's kind of one frontier of this area going forward that I'm actively involved in. There are many others, so I'm happy to take a break uh, in this quick overview of this dynamic, exciting area. I think Miriam has a few questions for me, and then I think I saw a few come up in the chat. This might be a good time to uh, make this more interactive. Yes, I received a few questions from the chat box. And the first one is, how can public health practitioners use Clearinghouse to identify and select intervention appropriate for their local context? That's a great question. Um, and it's what we will be showing a quick work example of in the second section with a Clearinghouse focused on child welfare. Um, but essentially, I think the first step is 
finding the right clearing house or clearing houses for your topic area. So some span public health issues. Some are very focused on particular issues like things in educational settings, criminal justice settings, community-based settings, but finding the right one or ones that are likely to have programs that are relevant to your context. And then secondly, following our program planning models like the pre-seed pre -seed, proceed model, strategic planning frameworks, a big one in substance use, you use your clearinghouse as the tool in that collaborative process with your local stakeholders to identify or assess your local needs and then identify using the clearinghouse a program that's the best match for those needs. So there's, that's a general process, but there are loads of guides, models, tools, and frameworks to kind of help you through that. I'll show you one in a second here, but again, uh, knowing this is a quick overview, uh, please feel free to hit me up at any time. I love talking about this stuff and, and helping the real heroes out there use them to see if there's a program out there that will really move the needle on your issues in your population. And another one is, um, are there any example of using clearing houses in, to improve public health here in Indiana? Uh, that is also a great question. There sure are. Um, so this was cool for me. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm from Los Angeles originally. So I've been in Indiana for a couple years now. Uh, but this has been my area of research for a while. And I, I stumbled into a state that actually has some really stuff on the pushing frontier edge of this. Um, so one locally, uh, the Indiana Division of Mental Health and Addiction, they manage our state's substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant. So that's the, the federal program from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency to give states money to then fund at the local level prevention and treatment efforts for substance use. Um, so when local agencies and organizations apply to DMHA for prevention funding, they're asked to include information on evidence showing that their intervention has positive effects for their priority problems in their populations of interest. And they've created this evidence-based practice guide that educates applicants on the rationale for using evidence-based practices and then assist them in selecting practices that align with community needs through something they call an evidence of effectiveness table. So in this way, they're using that funding mechanism to infuse the routine use of research evidence in the programs that they fund at the local level. Um, and I'm, I'm now a member of that advisory board and we're looking in ways to kind of capture best practices from this and share with other states who are doing this because I think there's something in the water in Indiana that's worth sharing with other states in the country. There are others, but I'll leave room for other questions. Um, thank you. Those are all we had for now. Um, thank you um, all for a great question. Now Dr. Grant will begin the second part of his presentation about his work related to evidence clearing houses. Okay, cool. Yeah, if there's nothing else, then I'm happy to do a quick demonstration of what one of these looks like and then open the floor for just kind of wider discussion can stop the slide share and, and make this an open presentation. Um, but uh, I've got some screen shares or screen captures of my couple slides coming up and then I might show you myself uh, via my browser uh, a function to compare programs that make it through the selection process. But if you want to follow along on your computer for those of you who are online as opposed to calling in that's the link for this clearinghouse uh, or you can Google the CEBC or the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse. That's the one we'll be looking at today. So while you're pulling that up, I'll just give you a brief overview of this particular clearinghouse. I selected it because I imagine there might be some folks to whom this clearinghouse is actually relevant. And then in addition to that, from my perspective, I think they have just done a fantastic job of creating a, uh, a, a, a registry of programs on their website that's easy to navigate, uh, to compare programs that kind of make it through your program planning process, and then also uh, loads of guides for how to use their resource and then think about implementation in your local setting. They have connections to those who can provide you technical assistance with these issues, and they have guides to tailor how you might use this clearinghouse if you're a student, so if there are any MPH students here, great stuff. If there's a professor asking you to do this for a class assignment or a final project, uh, for professors for incorporating this into your work, for heads of local organizations trying to find a program, 
if you are administrator at the state level and you want to create a tiered evidence initiative or an evidence-based financing mechanism, how to do that using these kinds of resources, or if perhaps there are folks on here who are more on the investing side and trying to give back to public health, how to work with maybe public-private uh, enterprises to create these mechanisms and support them through the private sector. So I think it's just a great resource that has a lot of transferable principles to clearing houses and other policy sectors if, if child welfare is not your particular sector. So with that being said, the mission of the California Evidence-Based Clearing House for Child Welfare is to advance the effective implementation of evidence-based practices for children and families in the child welfare system. So it aims to assist systems and agencies in making critical decisions around both the selection of evidence-based programs and then once you've selected something that fits your local context and has strong research evidence, how do you implement that in a sustainable, effective way? And in particular, if you go to the View Programs tab, wherever you are on the site, that is the CEBC Program Registry, which provides information on the evidence-based programs that target child welfare and provides information that might be useful to state agencies, county agencies, public and private organizations or individuals who are interested in this information. They try to provide it in a simple, straightforward format so that reduces you, the user's need to conduct extensive literature searches. The nerds do that and then try and distill that in the best way so you get the core knowledge, the core pieces of information that you need to then implement and translate research findings into public health policy and practice. As I mentioned, there's a page on here that has loads of resources and tools housed on the website to really help you think through these processes. But if you need technical assistance, they have folks that I think they have recommendations for, or plenty of us here at Fairbanks, so I think it would be lovely to chat with about this. I certainly would be keen if you're interested. So what I wanna do today is walk through the different ways that you can search their registry. And you can either do these in isolation or you can combine them to find interventions that meet multiple criteria of importance to you. So one way to search their, their registry is just to say, I want to find programs that meet a minimum quality in terms of research evidence. So what you're really interested in is delivering the most well-supported program. And then once you see the list of those, then you can prioritize and winnow down that list based on other criteria to make sure you find something that's not just well-supported, but relevant to your population, to your setting, to the resources that your providers have to actually deliver an intervention. So in this scale from one to five, one represents a practice with the strongest research evidence, the most well-supported intervention, and then five represents a practice that is actually concerning. So there's actually strong evidence, but the strong evidence suggests that the program is iatrogenic, that the program might actually pose substantial risk, might actually harm children and their families. And that's very possible. It's very possible that well-intentioned programs, when you evaluate them, you actually see they have negative effects. So that's the importance to really evaluate these programs and then disseminate this intervention to folks in the area. And then there are some programs that currently do not have strong enough research evidence to be rated on this continuum. And they're classified as NR, not able to be rated. So it's not saying that they work or they don't work, it's saying we don't know in terms of research evidence whether they work or not. And in particular, this clearinghouse prioritizes interventions with this rating that are commonly in use. So are there practices or programs that are commonly used in child welfare systems that actually don't have any research evidence behind them that meets these rigorous standards? And then that might incentivize, say, researchers to submit an application to a sponsor to fund an evaluation of that program, saying it's got great reach, now let's see if it's well supported, and then that could mean it gets stronger support in the child welfare system to be scaled up even further. You can also search by the relevance of that study's population and setting to your own child welfare system. So they've got three tiers, high, medium, or low. High means that the program was actually designed for the child welfare service system. Medium means that it wasn't designed for child welfare, but the system is likely very similar to the child welfare services, child welfare system. And low means that while it addresses outcomes we care about, it was tested in a population and a setting 
that is actually not very similar to child welfare services populations or systems. So there might be some applicability issues and you really want to think through, is this something that we can implement, even if it has strong evidence for outcomes we care about. You can also search by outcomes and topic areas. So this is just a sampling of the different outcomes, goals, objectives that these programs might target. So if you're at your starting point is we really want to move the needle on behavior management, particularly through parent training, then you would subset this registry on programs that have evidence for that outcome. And you can select multiple outcomes if you want to have uh, a list of programs that do that as well as engage, uh, uh, have engagement in parent partnering programs combined with them. So you can use this to winnow down on those programs that target your goals, your objectives, your outcomes, and then from there prioritize based on other criteria. You can search by the age of the child. So if what you really care about is you know that you're working in a service setting that is for elementary school children ages five to 11, then you can subset on just those age groups and say, well, I wanna see programs that have any of those ages. I don't care which one, as long as it's something in that range, or I wanna find programs that target that entire age range because I need to find something that I can implement to any child five through 11 in my setting, in my service system. Oh, that's a duplicate slide. Um, oh, I think that's what it was. So I skipped the last, this shouldn't say outcomes and topic areas. This should say program delivery options. So maybe what you're interested in is the setting that it's being delivered in and the ways that it can be implemented. So the various settings in the child welfare system include adoptive homes, the birth family home, community-based organizations, foster or kinship care, group or residential care, hospital settings, school settings, and especially now with COVID, telehealth, so things that you can do virtually. So a, a limiting factor for what you can implement is the setting in which a program was tested and deemed evidence-based. That's one more filter that you can use to prioritize and identify programs that are relevant to your needs. So if you are online and you want to give this a shot yourself, um, I've got one screenshot after this slide, and then I'll show you in my browser what the compare intervention function looks like. But if you want to go to this part of the website, it's their search page and then their advanced search, you'll see a list of these different kinds of criteria or filters that I've just gone through. And so if you want to follow along with what I've done, let's say that you want to find programs that are the most well supported by research evidence at the level one you are particularly focused on substance use prevention programs. So you select that topic area, that's the area that you're trying to address within the child welfare system. And you are a community-based organization, community-based agency, a community-based provider. So you know that if you select these criteria, you're gonna get a very strongly evidence-based intervention that addresses substance use prevention outcomes and has been tested in delivery settings like yours and CBOs. So if you click those three options, you should see these two programs, Familias Unitas, which is for parents of Hispanic adolescents between 12 to 16 years old and the adolescents themselves, and the Strengthening Families program for parents and youth 10 to 14. So when you do those selections on those filters, it gives you this brief summary uh, particularly for the options that you've chosen in your filters to confirm, yes, these are the kinds of interventions that you were looking for. And then if you go to their website and you're at this page, you should see these little buttons that allow you to compare the two programs. So I'm gonna switch to my browser so you can see what that looks like in an interactive setting. So apologies if this is disorienting for a moment. Ready to go. Can you see this? Marion, can you see the browser? Yes. Okay, cool. So if you're on the search results page, then you have these two programs. You'll see these compare buttons, and you'll want to switch them both on. And then you'll have a compare programs button here. 
And that will take you to this page, which then provides a side-by-side -side comparison of these programs. So if you've gone through a program planning model, a program planning process, and you really wanna look at these side-by-side, -side, even though they are in your topic area, they are both well supported by the research evidence, and they are delivered by community-based organizations, there are still going to be differences for these two different programs. And looking at a brief description of them, their specific program goals, the target population, the age range targeted, specific aspects of the services themselves, you know, what services are for the children or adolescents, which are for the parents and caregivers, how intense are the programs, how long are the programs, are there other delivery settings besides CBOs that this could be delivered in? If you have, say, folks in some kind of coalition working with you in those settings, is that of interest? Resources needed for training. So training is a big part of implementing these with fidelity once you select intervention. So what languages are the materials available in? What resources do you need? And so ask yourself, do you have the resources to finance this training? the qualifications required for providers. Does that match who you have available in your settings or systems or the ability to hire? Uh, and in particular, are there explicit manuals on the programs available and then training offered by the developers of the program, which from implementation science suggests are, are really important resources to help folks to implement these programs well. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Grant. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, don't no worry. I should have I should have warned. Last slide. Last slide, and the floor is yours. So then, as you do this, as I mentioned, uh, this space in general, the social and behavioral sciences, the evidence-based practice space, there are loads of guides to help you select and implement interventions that are evidence-based. Again, why I like the CEBC is they have a guide specific to their registry of programs and they have a great advisory board of experts in implementation science as well as folks who are involved in actually selecting and implementing practices at the local and state levels so it provides concrete information that you can use to evaluate your needs examine which programs are currently being used in your system so you know making sure that you take stock of your current assets and what you're already doing make decisions about which programs you might want to add using the registry, and then plan for implementation activities. And the report itself has a, a front section that kind of walks through the steps at a high level, and then it has numerous appendices that you can use that actually have worksheets, tables, et cetera, to use the registry and do that kind of prioritization exercise, compare programs, see which ones are a great fit, and have strong evidence. So that's the link for that guide. And this link down below, happy to share slides or share the, the website if this is of interest to folks. Uh, the American Institutes of Research has, I think, the most comprehensive website of all of the clearinghouses that are out there across health and social policy sectors. So if child welfare is not yours, I can almost guarantee that there's at least one clearinghouse out there that meets your needs, meets your population's needs, addresses the public health issues that you care about. So happy, Miriam, to turn over to you if there are any questions or conversations. But uh, after this, this is my explicit approval. Uh, henceforth, you are solicited to reach out to just chat about this area, chat about its application to your particular topics, or think about what the future is for the selection of evidence-based programs and practices in the social and behavioral area of public health. With that, now I promise, Miriam, Conch Shell turns over to you. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, the first question is, how are clearinghouses formed and how can we improve them if needed to? Oh, great question. So they're definitely not all created equal. Um, one report, if whoever's asking this, that I would recommend Googling is the What Works Marketplace by the Bridgespan Group. It's a few years old now, so there might be some clearinghouses missing from their list, but they did a quite rigorous analysis of the entire ecosystem of finding and implementing what works. And in that, they came up with this typology of the different types of clearinghouses. So some are federally run. So a lot of the ones I showed earlier are actually 
sponsored by and run by staff at federal agencies. There's quite a lot in the Health and Human Services Department. Some are federally financed, but then subcontracted out to research firms, research organizations to run. And so you'd both want to, if you're interested in, in providing feedback, to chat with those firms as well as staff at the federal agencies. Some are run at state level mechanisms. So Washington, Ohio, and Wisconsin are three states that come to mind that have quite rigorous um, clearinghouses and Washington in particular, it's a very close collaboration with their state legislature and they do rigorous cost effectiveness analyses. So they think about for our state, what is the cost effectiveness or the cost benefit of particular programs? Because resources determine what gets selected a lot too. And then some are just private. So uh, one of my grad school advisors is on the advisory group for Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. That is privately run at a university funded by foundations. And they are a clearinghouse that really moves the needle on research rigor and figures out ways to review the literature on those. And you tend to see the advances that they're incorporating from social and behavioral sciences uh, get taken up by federal clearinghouses or state-run clearinghouses a few years later. So they're kind of the innovators. So if you've got particular issues that might be tough for those who are responding to or live in a kind of socioeconomic, political government environment, uh, I'd start with the private ones, chat things through with them, figure out the kinks in implementing an innovation, and then chat with the folks at the, the government-run ones, all of whom, in my experience, are just lovely, intelligent people who care about issues and are always open for conversation. So don't be shy. <laughs> and then we have another question from Luke. How would the evidence rating compare to how would the evidence rating compare to like the community guide or the Cochrane review? How much do they vary between different clearing houses? Also, do any guideline estimate affordability and total cost or cost effectiveness? I can read it again, Dr. Grant, if you like. Yeah, let me take, I'll take the first one and then I might need you to repeat because I have a goldfish memory. So I will forget the second question as soon as I'm done. But the first question, community guide, Cochrane, Campbell, all groups I've been engaged with or part of, um, they're, depending on how one defines a clearinghouse, some folks include those in their list. Others say that they're allied kinds of initiatives that are synthesizing the research evidence to inform policy and practice. I think a big difference between those and some of the federal clearinghouses that I've mentioned in particular is uh, the Community Guide, Cochrane, Campbell, um, the, the National Institutes of Clinical Excellence in the UK that does reviews for their healthcare system. They tend not to look at brand name programs, but programs in a given area and do something called meta-analysis, where you take all of the quantitative data on outcomes from, say, randomized trials and synthesize them together in one analysis and say, here's the average effect of this community-based smoking prevention type of program, family of programs on smoking cessation, prevention of smoking, et cetera. Um, so it's really like a totality of evidence, not with respect to specific kinds of programs, a lot of the clearinghouses that I've talked about look at brand name programs. So they'll say strengthening families. They'll say Familius Unitas. When Cochrane, Campbell might combine those in one thing and say, you know, uh, what were the two filters I used? Community-based organization delivered substance use prevention programs. Clearinghouses will give you brand name programs because those tend to be attached with training opportunities, with program manuals, with things that actual deliverers say, this is what I need to then implement the insights we get from a Cochrane review or a Campbell review or the community guide. There are other uh, differences and it's kind of a fuzzy boundary, but I'd say that's the most stark one. All united in this effort to figure out what works and translate it into research evidence. Full disclosure, I'm a methods editor at Campbell for their knowledge translation and implementation group. So if you're keen to chat about Campbell stuff, I'm also happy to do that. Thank you, Dr. Grant. And I think the second part of the question was, um, are there any guides um, that estimate affordability analysis, total cost or cost effectiveness? Yeah, great question. So as I mentioned, there are some like uh, the Washington State one is called WSIPP, W-S-I-P-P. -P. 
So they do full on cost effectiveness analyses. They're tailored for Washington, right? Because costs for certain resources may differ state to state, but they do a full blown cost benefit or effectiveness analysis. Um, then there are some clearinghouses, I don't think CEBC has it, but I know others do, where they actually figure out to the dollar, how much does training cost? How much does the program manual cost? What was the reimbursement rate for providers in the studies that were used to determine something as evidence-based? So they give you an idea of if you have to come up with a budget and a budget justification, what those numbers would be, what those units are. So you could say, well, is that the unit cost for this, for my setting, for my state, or do I need to adapt that because I'm in a different state or that, that study was 10 years ago and things cost mm -hmm. differently in 2021 than they do in 2011. But yes, some are out there. Happy to also follow up about that. Okay, um, the next question is, does the clearinghouse also have information on evidence-based policy at state or organizational level from Dr. Stone? And I think you briefly mentioned that when you talked about um, the clearinghouse in Indiana. Yeah, I love that question. Um, so Cynthia, let's chat more. They, they tend to focus more on individual interpersonal or at best community level interventions. There are a few that have looked at things at the state level. So the What Works for Health that uh, is run in Wisconsin has some things at that higher level of the social ecological model that look at things at the state level or the policy level. Um, and then the labor's clearinghouse, which they call CLEAR um, for labor interventions, they have also looked at state level um, interventions or policies that are related to unemployment at the state level. But uh, it's scarce to see things at that level. I think you're probably better off looking at groups that do um, systematic reviews or publish in the scientific literature on the effectiveness of things at the state level. Uh, my colleagues at Rand and I are working on that in the opioid space um, and perhaps trying to mimic what's done through um, the NIAAA's APIS, the Alcohol Policy Information System, APIS, which has a typology of state level alcohol policies and tries to summarize the evidence behind them. Can we build something similar for opioid policies at the state level? And then shout out to Ross Silverman. He and I are trying to work on something similar um, at the county and ordinance level. So early days there, but we're very keen to collaborate with folks who are interested, particularly those who are in counties in that kind of ordinance ecosystem subject to them and want to move the needle in Indiana. Thank you, Dr. Grant. And the next question is, and after this, we have one more um, from Jyotna. I hope I said that right. Um, is there a feedback mechanism where communities slash organizations who have implemented these in intervention can share their experiences? Great question. Uh, it depends on the clearinghouse, but yes, most of them have uh, contact details uh, and have the ability to provide information or feedback that a clearinghouse might either take into consideration when they update or actually report back out. Um, so it might not be something that ultimately is public facing, but then they use if they get calls or if they get a, a request for assistance by a community provider to select intervention, they'll say, well, here's what we've heard from other folks. Perhaps they give that feedback to the program developers. Um, and then there are some that allow developers and programs. So if you've got an innovative program in your area that you'd wanna see on one of these lists, but they have opportunities usually annually to submit the, the evidence that you have on your program. So it can get rated according to these standards. I'd say that your best bet in addition to that is providing feedback to the program developer or the organization, they're called purveyor organizations sometimes, the organizations that are in charge of the training and just give them feedback so that they can incorporate it with uh, the training that they give in the future to those who have selected their program. But continuous quality improvement. That's, that sounded like a question from one of our MPH grads. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Dr. Staten. What will work? What will this work look like? Sorry. What will this work look like 10 years from now? Basically, how do you see this work evolving? Uh, I love this question too. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so 
I, man, loads of things come to mind. I think um, from my point of view, the two that I'm particularly keen to explore, let me say three, there are three. One, I think there might be too many of these. I would love to see them amalgamated in one place. Um, so that's kind of a one-stop shop with uh, standardized standards so that what's evidence-based doesn't vary from place to place. So how do we get rid of the silos and combine resources, knowing the kinds of resource and political, economic, social environments these things are embedded in? So that's one thing I would love 10 years from now to see kind of a unified place to go. Um, two, I would love to see greater collaboration with these tiered evidence mechanisms and them being proactive. So I think a lot of these follow a bit of a, a field of dreams model where they build it and they expect folks to come. And I think there are real equity concerns with that. Folks who have the resources already have the connections are more likely to know how to do these processes, to reach out to these organizations, to use these clearinghouses. But if we really want them to be used say throughout the state of Indiana, proactively identifying our portfolio of things that we fund and reaching out to the places that might need it most and providing support for them. And I feel like Fairbanks is in a great position to do that. It's, and it's part of our mission as a state school of public health. So that would be a second one. And then the third one has escaped me, but I'm sure it'll come back as soon as you start your next question. So that's a pattern of mine for those who take classes with me. That should be no surprise. Oh, I remembered it. So third one, a lot of these resources now, um, I was at a conference that made a great comparison between um, Thomas guides and GPS. For those of us who remember using a Thomas guide or printing up maps on something like MapQuest, and then you've got this static page in front of you that you then have to use to navigate the dynamic world you're navigating. And can we transform our implementation support tools into something that's more like a GPS that says in real time, here are the issues that I'm facing, can interactively engage with these kinds of registries, these kinds of databases and say in live, here's what you should be doing now and, and helps you in thinking through your dynamic environment. And there's some work in that space. I wanna say in mental health treatment, I'd love to see it in health promotion and disease prevention in these kinds of programs. Thank you, Dr. Grant. I have two questions. I'm gonna ask them as one, just to be mindful of your time. Um, are there I'm hopped up on caffeine, so I can answer quickly. Okay. Are there standards, are there standards or guidelines which a clearinghouse must be met? Must meet, sorry. Are there standards or guidelines which a clearinghouse must meet to be formed? And moving forward, what do you think need to be done to improve the use of clearinghouses and similar resources for the implementation of evidence-based practices? Awesome question. So the first, um, it depends again on what kind of clearinghouse. So if you wanna create one, uh, or if you wanna support Fairbanks in creating one, you know, we can do as we please. You'd want it to be credible. So you'd want it to have standards of evidence based in the research literature, follow uh, insights from implementation science on what is useful for presenting that information in a way for decision makers. Um, but if, you know, from that point, it's if a foundation said create it and we're open to where you want to go with it, it's really kind of dependent on your funder. The government run ones tend to exist more in a regulatory environment. So thinking about prevention services clearinghouse, the family, uh, the, the child welfare one that is run through the federal government, there's language in the legislation. So it's not even an order, an executive order or a regulation from the, from the federal agency. It's written into law from a congressional bill and signed by the president. So changing the requirements there are much more difficult. So the trade-offs are, it's a bit static and there are rigorous requirements that it has to meet to be compliant with that bill and therefore facilitate federal appropriation of funds to states. The benefit of that is there's sustainability there. It's, in, it's a line item in our federal budget. And there have been a lot of clearing houses that have come and go from the private side because they can be, depending on your scope and what you're doing with it, rather expensive to run, and you want to try and keep them as free at the point of service to those who want to use them. So you can, I think there's a trade-off from what I've seen from uh, having to meet requirements to set them up, but then having more sustainable funding versus more freedom, but what is that being plugged into? Can you find someone who will support it in the long term? So I think it's really important to have a clear charge that someone supports in a given geographic space and a given public health sector. 
happy to chat about that more. Second question again, Miriam was, oh, you're on mute. Sorry, it was moving forward. What need to be done to improve the use of clearing houses? Of the clearing houses, yes. So uh, shout out to William T. Grant Foundation. I have a project starting this month. They have a portfolio called Use of Research Evidence, and it really investigates, okay, we have this idealized model of evidence-based practice, and we just assume folks are going to follow it. Is that what's actually done? So actually doing research on the use of research evidence through these clearing houses in a strengths-based empowerment framework. So it's not a framework where we're gonna go, no, 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 to tsk, tsk, because you didn't follow our model, but you're using that to, in the future, provide better supports, provide better resources, so that our local and state decision makers, our folks on the front lines, can use these better. And particularly, as I said, with the portfolio mindset, being proactive and getting those folks that really need our support to provide it to them. So right now, I think it, it really is doing rigorous research on these mechanisms as if they were an intervention and apply our continuous quality improvement frameworks that we apply to programs and practices to these clearinghouses, to the guides that they create, to the selection processes, to the financing mechanisms. So I'm starting an active portfolio of research on that. Also love to chat about that, whoever asked the question. Um. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Um, thank you all for participating today. Um, this concludes our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Grant, for elaborating on the issues surrounding what works in addressing social and behavioral determinants of health and how evidence clearing houses can be used to inform public health policy and practice in this space. So if you have any question, um, feel free to reach out to Dr. Grant. He shared his information. Now, Crystal Jones, the school director of development and alumni relations, has a special announcement about IU Day on April 21st. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam and Dr. Grant. I promise this will be quick. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't skip April, uh, the April first Fridays with Fairbanks and not mention that IU Day is coming up on April 21st. And so in the chat box, I have included to an a link to an IU Day toolkit, which we've created for all FSPH alumni to use leading up to and on IU Day, April 21st. If you haven't heard of IU Day before, it is a day long celebration of all things IU, where alumni throughout the world celebrate IU by engaging in four activities, give, share, watch, and connect. The toolkit which we've provided just really gives you some downloadable graphics to use for your social media pages, as well as hashtags for each post to really make sure the FSPH community stands out. Uh, we know that this year has really been unlike any other and, and we really plan to celebrate you and all you have done as public health and health administration professionals behind the scenes, uh, you know, during one of the most challenging years of our lives. And, and, and we know that because of you, a bright future is really a reality for all of us in the months ahead, but also there's a bright future for our students because of your consistent support of us through scholarships, internships, and, and mentorships. So I look forward to celebrating you all on IU Day and uh, also seeing you next month on May 7th at our first Fridays with Fairbanks event, which will feature PhD student Yifi Zhang and Dr. Yang Zong of our biostatistics department. And so just a quick programming is after May 7th, we are going to take a, a sh short summer break. We're going to welcome our new alumni board officers and really begin planning our 2021 um, 2022 alumni programming. And so thank you all for your participation today and, and throughout all of the sessions. It's really been so fun to, to do this with all of you. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Crystal. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Miriam. No problem. Bye. Thank you.